Well, good morning again. Before we uh, begin our teaching, I want to just share something with you and have a prayer. Um, I shared with you in, uh, on Easter about my uh, dear friend and beloved uh, spiritual son in Jesus, Confessor Martinez. And um, I also shared we did a Life Reframed podcast that many of you tearfully listened to. Uh, Confessor went to be with Jesus in the arms of his wife in the presence of his nine children on August the 27th. And this last weekend I was in Chicago for the, uh, the service and uh, I'm heartbroken. But I'm not the only one who's heartbroken. There are a lot of people in this church who are heartbroken, who've had hard seasons or hard years and people that you know. And I just wanted to take a moment and remind ourselves of this great hope that we just sang, in Christ alone, our hope is found. I had the privilege of being the confessor in Rush Hospital just, just prior to his death, just very few hours before he died, and prayer and celebration of Jesus. And um, then by the kindness of uh, Rush Hospital and the mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he got his wish to be taken by ambulance to his home, to die in his own home. And when he got to his home, he had, there was no strength left. He was an hour and a half from his death. But he raised his arm and he said, let's do this. One of our members, Katie Gleason, wrote recently on Facebook, sometimes the hardest things are the most beautiful things. And that is true in Confessor's life and heart. In my life, so many losses and yet so much hope. And, and so this morning, as we look at a passage that's really about where's your hope, every day in your own heart. Where's your hope? It won't sound like that to begin with, but it's really what it's about. Let us be reminded that the deeper the hard, the greater the hope. And whatever you might be facing or a loved one might be facing right now, the hope not only holds, it secures and it strengthens. And that, my friends, is good and full of grace. Let's pray. Lord, we are mindful not only of our own lives, but of one another. We are mindful in a season where loss has rapidly increased from little things to huge things. We're reminded in Katie's words that, that in the midst of the heart is the beautiful. In the midst of even the death is the life. In Christ alone, my hope is found. And we stand here, Lord, and we learn today as a people who want to know what, what that might look like this afternoon, what it might look like in, in dealing with our own need for grace, our own need for hope, and dealing with our own hearts. And so we submit our time to you and to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So at first glance, the Sermon on the Mount looks like a Pinterest palooza, right? I mean, there's just all kinds of things you want to put on a plaque, a poster, a mug, a t-shirt. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Our Father who art in heaven. It's just full of these incredibly powerful, what I would say, affirming kinds of truths. But that's to think it's a feel-good passage about being good and being a good person. No. It's actually a crushing blow. The first, like, particularly chapter five and into early chapter six, is a crushing blow on the false notion that we can be religiously good enough or humanistically good enough to any thought that the role of the, the pursuit of our Christian journey is to just to be good. And if, and if you don't see it yet, you will next week when you get to the end in chapter five, verse 48, that says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's the standard so let's just end all hope on human sufficiency and goodness. We're just going to go, that's not going to work. And try to understand not only why it doesn't work, but why it points us to the hope that we do have in Jesus, because there is hope. And the hope is in the perfect one, the gospel and the life and the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to take a moment and just understand the difference in our context and those who are hearing Jesus speak in Matthew 5. So if you want to take a, journey, a little side journey with me, we'll come back to. Go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Paul is writing to a group of people who 
have been freed by grace from the law and now they're going back and say, yeah, I know it's by grace, but we gotta keep the law. Like, we gotta be good. We gotta get this right. This is about behavior and religious goodness. And so Paul says in chapter five, verse 16, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And Paul is going to, to, to speak to the Galatians about this incredible tension that happens between the flesh and the spirit. And understand at this point in Matthew 5, the listeners aren't aware of what it means to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They're not there. They're being prepared for that truth. And just so understand, when, we, when we're saying these things today, it falls differently on that group of people than it does you. And context matters on how we hear things. When I was in Chicago last week after the service, I went back downtown to my hotel and I called Mother Hubbard Bar, which was near me, and I said, hey, I wanna watch the Tennessee Ole Miss game. Do you have a TV that has the SEC network on it? And the, and the sweet young lady said, I'm sorry, the what? <laughs> I said, Tennessee Ole Miss SEC network. She said, the, the NEC network? For the love of Paul Feinbaum, the SEC network, right? I mean, I was, I, it just it reminded me, I love Chicago, but how could you not know what the SEC network is, right? This is the, and I love being here because of that. Context matters, what we hear matters. Understand these are people who are hearing this teaching, believing that you've gotta be as good as you can and then make sacrifice and offerings to make up for it and then you're okay. And Jesus is just gonna say, you're misunderstanding the whole point. And he's gonna talk about five topics, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, and retaliation. Each one is a sermon in itself, so I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna focus on the first two, acknowledge the last three, because I want you to understand what's, what he's teaching at a deep level about the flesh's opposition to God and this reality, you ready? The blood of animals could never atone for human sin. It's never intended to. Tim Keller says this, the gospel shows us a God far more holy than a legalist can bear and yet more merciful than a humanist can conceive. He is so holy that only he could ever possible atone for the death that we deserved. And he's so merciful that he reaches into our lives and where we are not able to do the good and becomes that good for us. The anger and the lust and the divorce and the oaths and the retaliation are just symptoms. They're just, just ways of beginning to describe, trying to say what Greg taught last week. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and the listeners like, what do you, like we read that and we're like, we have a negative connotation there. They're thinking, those are the most religious A plus people there are. If they can't get it right, what hope do we have? And that's the point, none, and neither do they. Because the scribes and the Pharisees, like, like Rick, like let's don't, throw, let's don't throw shade on the scribes and Pharisees, let's make it what it's real. Just like me, my interpretive grid the way I naturally frame my understanding of my spiritual growth is my capacity to be a good person, to be a Christ follower. My flesh is capacity. And Jesus is gonna teach us, no, that's not it. And therein will lie the daily practice of hope that prepares us for the hard things in life. So if you have your Bibles, we go to Matthew chapter five, verse 21. Jesus is, is giving this kind of a contrast all throughout the, these, the rest of these, uh, what's it, uh, 21 verses. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So he's hearkening back, this is what you've been taught, and this is what you've heard, and I know you understand it, and I know that you, you, do, you won't murder because you understand the consequences of that. That's an offense to God, an offense to his created people. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, the Sanhedrin. And whoever says you fool or raka will be liable to the hell of fire. Um, last week, some of you saw, I tell this story on Facebook. I, I, I get on my commuter train from Chicago at like 5.30 in the morning. And 
I get to the station after I walk about 15 minutes. It's 5.45 and the train is delayed 20 minutes and there's a bunch of people with me who are trying to catch flights. Some of those people are gonna be liable to the council for what they said. <laughs> and then we got on the train and I've never had this happen before, on a Chicago commuter train, which was pretty darn full. We get three exits from O'Hare. Some of you may be familiar with the Harlem station. We get three exits uh, stations from O'Hare and they stop the train and says, hey, we're just gonna need you all to get off the train. There's police activity at the next station. We'll get buses out here. Now these are all people trying to catch their plane, right? Some of the people there are liable to the hell of fire, all right? So <laughs> the blame and the accusation and, the, and just the anger that just kind of rose up and look, here's the deal. This is an angry world right now. And I'm a part of it. I told a friend this last week, I can't believe how fast I get angry right now. How quick my fuse is. Preparing a teaching on anger and Jesus teaching on holiness and righteousness and hope and grace. And yesterday I was doing, I'm a visual person, so I do my slides myself and I, been about three hours putting my slides together, got just the way I wanted it and lost it. <laughs> Suddenly I became liable to lots of things. <laughs> you would think the guy preparing the sermon to help us understand the darkness of anger in our hearts would be able to not get so angry when his slides didn't work. Or when I went to the Mexican restaurant and they don't have chips, how do you not have chips? <laughs> I understand supply chain, it's a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> and I remember when I collapsed into my wife's arms in the spring after Confessor called and said, it's back. And I wept in her arms and said, I can't do this too. Anger, the emotion of anger is not the problem. The scriptures say, be angry and do not sin. Feeling angry, having that response, having that emotion, that is not in itself the sin, okay? Let's just make sure we understand. If you find yourself feel a feeling of anger, sometimes it's rightly placed, sometimes it's not, but it's still, it's the emotion, right? It's, it's what you have. It tells you what's going on inside of you. It tells you what goal in your life is blocked. But to feel anger, Jesus felt and expressed anger but it was always rooted in holiness, integrity, righteousness, and love, and in humility, Jesus would present his anger in such a way to draw you to the Father. That's not, that's not, this passage is not talking about that. It's talking about when we have an unrighteous anger. The word fool here, raka, is, is basically to say, you know, I'm not gonna point anybody because that would be unhealthy in a sermon. I'm just going, you know, um, you're worthless. You don't matter, I matter, you don't. You're a freaking idiot. Those words come out of my mouth sometimes. That's not righteous. That's not okay. It's murder compared to the holiness of God. Jesus is saying, you don't understand. The standard is not that you didn't act to kill the person. It's what was in your heart that mattered. Unrighteous anger is anger that responds to a perceived offense. I perceive an offense. And so I respond to it by exalting my demands for power, control, and justice over what is good and loving and just in God's eyes. Let me say that again. I exalt my demands for power, control, and justice over what God's eyes would see as good and loving and just. And when I do, and I do, I violate God's purpose in others as his creation, and I contradict God's design for love, thus committing heart murder. I am a serial killer in my heart. And I get into a situation, whether it's a political situation, 
a theological situation, a relational situation, and somebody comes at me or comes at my ideas or comes at my tribe or comes at my family or comes at somewhere with their anger, and guess what I do? I justify it because they got angry first. It seems okay to our flesh to be angry at people who deserve it. Have you noticed that? That we deem who deserve it. It seems okay to our flesh to take someone that we've deemed to be an idiot and to exalt ourselves over that person. And Jesus said, that's just flat out murder in your heart. Now, let me clarify if you're a, if you're a literalist. That doesn't mean, well, just go ahead and kill them because it doesn't matter. No, that's not what it means. There is, a different, there is a different liability that comes with actually committing the murder. But Jesus said in terms of holiness, you are in need, as in need of atonement and forgiveness if it's in your heart. And here's the thing I want you to know right now. If you want to live in that, it's easy because you'll find somebody in the news, social media, or on some Christian website who will validate your righteous anger against them I don't care what your position is. Somebody out there wants to help you validate. You have the right to be angry and invalidate that person. Right or left, Democrat, Republican, mask or no mask, vaccine or no vaccine. I don't care what it is. Somebody wants to validate that because it's in our heart. That's the flesh. And Jesus said, the standard is in here, not just what the flesh does. And you don't have the capacity to overcome this by yourself. You cannot fix this problem. You cannot find a way out of this just by anger management might be a good thing, but it's not gonna fix this. Next, adultery and lust. Lust. I know that's not a problem in our culture, but let's just, you know, for kicks, let's look at it. All right, here we go. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye, right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. The reason... Jesus uses this hyperbole is basically he's saying if it was a flesh problem, you should be this. This is how absolutely committed you should be to fixing this problem if it were a flesh problem, but it's not. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And it's really a heart issue in 2021 when some of you, I mean, I've lived long enough to, to understand what I'm about to say but the definition of what pornography is has changed. A lot of just straight up Netflix is, includes things that were considered pornographic not too long ago. Now, I'm not gonna make some religious standard of what you should and shouldn't watch on Netflix. You gotta stress and struggle through that yourself. There's not some easy answer out there on this one. But you need to be paying attention to it. Male and female. Uh, my wife is a uh, sex therapist. It's a part of what she does, which is I told my children, look, your dad's an evangelical church pastor. Your mom's a sex therapist. You will never find somebody to marry you. I promise you. <laughs> Fortunately, they chose well, and I have a wonderful son-in-law and daughter-in-law who still shake their heads sometimes. But <laughs> Teresa was talking about, I said, tell me about I know well the male lure towards nudity, sexual imagery, uh, sexual fantasy. I know that one really well. Obviously, I don't understand uh, female lust. And because she works with a lot of female sex addiction, I'm going to just give you a little bit. She would be a much better source on this. But she said, Rick, it has a lot to do with the fantasizing about being alluring and being pursued and fantasizing some person or some way in which you're being pursued sexually and being an alluring kind of a person. So that also has its fantasy, it also has its roots in some of the shows and the stories that we watch and read that tap into female lust. 
Lust objectifies a person into an image that feeds our fleshly desires for power and pleasure. Lust objectifies a person into an image that feeds our fleshly desires for power and pleasure. And we all, if we're adolescent or older, do it at some point, in some way. Not every day, maybe, not all the time, it's there. Maybe you've had an addiction, you've overcome it, and you're in a really healthy place with this. In some ways, if you've had an addiction and overcome it, you're healthier than a whole lot of other people who don't know that they have the problem and identified it. So don't carry shame. And if you're struggling with pornography or ideation or fantasy today, this isn't the place for shame. This is the place for hope. This is the place for grace. But understanding that when we have this treating another person as a commodity for our consumption, once again, we violate God's purpose in others as his creation and we contradict God's design for love, thus committing heart adultery. And I am a serial adulterer in my heart. I don't want to be, but there are times it happens. When I feel the pull especially strong, I will talk to my wife and say, hey, I don't know what's going on inside of me, but I've noticed I linger and look at things I shouldn't look at, or I, I, I let that post draw me into something I shouldn't be drawn into, or I let my mind go somewhere it shouldn't. About three years ago, I went to the elders and I said, hey, I want to tell you something, guys. I'm not... I'm not on internet porn, I'm not, but I'm just telling you, I feel so much luring of me that I just want you to know I'm gonna figure out what that is, but I wanna tell you early on, I feel a sexual struggle right now, and I've talked to my wife about it. Now, if that unnerves you about me, I hope not. I hope it helps you understand the human heart. This is what Jesus is saying. There is no, well, boys will be boys. No. And I want to add this. This is an aside. It's not necessary to teach it, but I want to add this. Have you ever watch these or listen to these shows like uh, 2020 or Dateline or any of those kinds of things? Here's like what I'll tell you. If the person was married and they got murdered, most of the time it was their, sp or if they're, if they're, if most of the time it's the spouse or lover, almost every time, right? Which doesn't mean you shouldn't trust your spouse, but I'm just saying... Watch your back. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but listen, here's the deal. As soon as the dateline or the 2020 says, and he's a suspect or she's a suspect, here's the question you should ask. Oh, I wonder who the affair was with. Because they're tied together. Because they're about power. And they're about being in control. And even our lust is fueled often by our anger. Well, I wouldn't have this problem if she. I wouldn't fall into this so often if he. That's the human heart. And Jesus wants us to understand this is the problem we're dealing with. And so later, when we understand the cross, we can start to understand, oh, the goat and the lamb weren't enough for that but I didn't murder anybody and I didn't commit adultery. So I don't really, I'm, you know, a little, little thought here, a little stuff there, a little anger in the heart. Surely a goat and a lamb can take care of that. No, it's murder and adultery. Just call it for what it is. Does that mean we should walk around in shame and, and, and grief about? No, it means, as Keller said, that he's far more holy and far more merciful. So let's go there. Let's just go there. Because grace abounds, and even in our hearts. Some of you may have read the, the book or watched the, the movie Into the Wild. It's a fascinating story about a guy named Christopher Johnson McCandless, graduated from Emory University, wealthy family, had some money left over in his college fund, gave it all away, went to Alaska in 1982, 1992, went to Alaska with the, with the commitment, I'm going to go get lost in the Alaskan wilderness and find my way back. Took a little bit of rice, a gun, a couple of, some ammunition, goes into the deal, crosses this frozen river, goes, has his adventure, shoots a moose, does his thing, whatever he needs to do, writes in his journal, comes back to come back, and all of a sudden the river has thawed. He didn't have that, that wasn't in the plan. So now he's run out of food, and he's run out of, like he's gonna be without food for a long time. He doesn't have ammunition to hunt. It's, it's the season where there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of fruit, there's not a lot of crops, it's just, he's in trouble. 
So he finds this one plant, this is what it looks like, uh, and it's actually, uh, it grows a, 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 a root that's kind of like a potato, and it actually is something that can nourish you. And so there's, it hasn't grown yet, so he just eats the seeds. So if you know the story, here's what happens. The seeds have a toxin in them. The more you eat, the more it shuts down your body's capacity to be nourished. Ready? The more you take in, the more it shuts down your capacity. So you get all this inside of you, but it can't nourish you, and so you actually starve to death, which is what he did in about 113 days. This is your culture. It feels good to be angry. It feels good to hate those people. Blankety blank blank people. Just feels righteous. Look, I'm not, it's not like I'm cheating on my wife or something. Everybody sneaks a peek. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go act on it. I just like to think about what it would be like to be in a relationship where the man actually pursued you. And Jesus says, that's your heart. That's your reality. And there is no hope anywhere but me. This, he's laying the groundwork. There is no hope. Now, because we live after the crucifixion and resurrection, the coming of the Spirit, let me give you the hope. Back to Galatians chapter five, verse 18. Galatians chapter five, verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. That reality of my anger this last week, I'm not condemned by that. I'm convicted by it. I'm not condemned by it. I can repent and have life as the spirit leads me. That moment when I watched that and I watched it longer because it was sexually arousing. I'm not condemned in that. I'm convicted in that. Jesus brings life in the spirit there. But if I stay in that watching, if I stay in that anger, I'm going to start to wither in time. See, this is what the law does to you. Way, it's just a burden, a burden, a burden, a burden. And the more you walk under it, the more your heart craves anything for nourishment and it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle. I've become more angry. I've become more lustful because I'm trying to get this flesh to cooperate and it just doesn't. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, which by the way, if you take a little bit of time, they're all about relationships and they're all about violating God's design for other people and his design for us to love well. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is not suggesting if you're a believer, you ever fall into one of these sins, that you're toast. It's that if you just keep on doing, you have to begin to ask yourself the question. If you're not willing to repent, you're not feeling convicted, you're not feeling the Spirit draw you towards something else, that's a problem. But these works of the flesh, Jesus has said to us, and we should understand now, aren't just when we do something bad and get caught. It's not just when we watch something we shouldn't watch and somebody caught us and all the shame just runs over us. It's not when we put the Facebook post or send the text and later think, oh, gee, and the shame comes upon us. It's that that's in our heart to begin with. And the flesh does not have the strength to overcome it. We're never going to be good enough. There has to be a source other than what our flesh can take in or we will live ourselves into worse and worse and worse places. And here's that beautiful word we love in the New Testament. But, ready? But the fruit of the Spirit and listen to these relationships, is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You can't legislate this stuff. It comes from within here. It comes from within the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's how we combat, if you will, 
the anger, the unrighteous anger and the unrighteous lust is by the real stuff, the real nurture, the real nourishment, the real life that's accessible to us. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Jesus is saying in these times, and you can go through the other three, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and you should really camp on retaliation a little bit because it's become the name of the game in American culture. Retaliation has become the way you win. Even among Christians screaming at each other. And we say, I understand this is death in here. I understand this flesh doesn't have the capacity. And I take this flesh and I say, hey, you aren't in charge. His power, not my power. His control, not my control. His desires, not my desires. His sources of satisfaction and pleasure, not my sources of satisfaction and pleasure. And for us as believers, that's how you cultivate hope. Because it's not in you. It's not hope in you. It's hope in him. I don't have any hope in me overcoming anger and lust when it comes to me, or retaliation. I have no hope that I'm going to be good enough to do that. I am 60 years old. I am educated. I am disciplined, and I can't do it. But he can. With mercy and grace and life and hope, which is the point of the Sermon on the Mount. So here is a look at a graph of Google searches for oximeter in the last like 18 months. And an oximeter is that little thing you put on the end of your finger to see how your oxygen level is. Why do you think we're, we're uh, having these spikes in oximeters? Because we understand, like Rick did in December of 2020, I've got COVID the one thing that can happen is my oxygen level get too low. I'm gonna to go to Walgreens and buy one of these things. My physician would probably say, that's like putting, you know, putting a weapon in the hand of a, you shouldn't do this anyway, but I did, right? So I'm walking around with my dang little oximeter to make sure I'm okay. Because I know if I lose breath, this thing could go bad. You need people in your life who help you like an oximeter, let you know where you are. You need to live in such a way that you understand how quickly you can get out of breath. And Andrew's gonna come up and lead us in a moment of worship, but I wanna tell you what I think. I think the Church of Jesus Christ in America is living with a shortness of breath. Having not breathed the Spirit, having not reckoned with the necessity of the Spirit in such hard moments. I know that's a challenge I've had. So I'm gonna do a little something with you. I'm not going all zen on you. Don't get nervous if you're new here, like, oh, great, we got a zen pastor. I'm not going zen. This is a physiological thing I want you to do. I just want you to do it with me just for a moment before we pray. I want you to take a breath and just hold it for a moment. Just hold it. Breathe in. Now I want you to breathe just a little bit more and just let it out really slowly. Feel what happens in your body. Here's the thing, I ask you to hold your breath and you breathe in, but there was more capacity. And when I said, hey, breathe deeper, you found more. And I'm saying to you, as your pastor, breathe deeper. Breathe deeper. Breathe deeper. Breathe deeper of his spirit. Let's pray for just a moment. Wherever the Lord may be reaching or touching you in this moment, you just let him do the spirit do its work. Let him have his way with you for a moment. Andrew's gonna, gonna play and I want you to spiritually take the deepest breath you've taken in a long time of his grace, his mercy, his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control against which there is no law and no burden.
That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The Sermon on the Mount will continue to tell us we need Jesus. And we need the Spirit. And we need life. And your neighbor and your family member and your children and your coworker and your roommate and your teammate need you to breathe deeply right now pour out praise to him. As always, elders and spouses will be available to pray with you. They're just like me. They're just men and women in need of the Spirit. They'd love to share that moment with you to pray for anything. I pray you have a wonderful week with him. Grace and peace.